Pa 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 pam 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 pa 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 pam pam pam. Hello, all of you beautiful people. Horror Vision 2020, and today, batter up because we have a heavy hitter in the industry. And Tommy and I are so excited for you guys to listen in because from the bottom of our hearts, we truly had an exceptional time. He is so much fun, and I know he had fun too. And it really stands out in the interview. I cannot wait for you guys to listen to his rise in the industry with Stan Winston and his visual special effects airbrush style, which is named after himself. And he is so humble about that, which is awesome. He is the reason the predator that we know and love today looks the way it looks. He has worked on so many amazing projects. And I can't wait for you guys to listen to the part where we talk about UFOs. Me and him went off for a few minutes and it was so much fun. His work with Blizzard Entertainment and video games. He's a writer, director, producer, and big time special effects dude. And here he is, Steve Wang. There we go. This is James, my friend. Good <laughs> afternoon. Sorry, I'm uh, jumping on a second or two late here. Oh, no way. He had a late night poker game, right? Oh, man. Well, I did. Hard. Online, though. It's online. Hope you, didn't, hope you didn't lose anything. Uh, just some dignity, I think, being up so late. <laughs> but besides that, um, yeah, it's uh, me and my buddies do it once a week. Uh, Zoom. It's on Zoom, and there's 12 of us. And uh, we play poker, talk, catch up. And it's kind of fun. It's kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think I'm doing more interaction than I ever have before. <laughs> yeah. Just doing interviews and stuff. <laughs> no, I'm really worried that this is going to be over soon. I'm really loving my vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got yeah. enemies, right? <laughs> yeah, I've actually been more productive lately in this lockdown. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing to do with, with work. I mean, I'm still working on, like, designing stuff, you know, for yeah. productions, whatever at home, but as far as like me wanting to learn how to do ZBrush, more, get more into the mechanics of all that, all these new software and stuff, yeah. I have so much more time now to do that. Yeah. Awesome. What's, well, what's that makes that? me even more excited to see some of your future projects then. <laughs> so what is Blender? Is My sons are using Blender. Yeah, I don't know what Blender is exactly. I, I don't use Blender, but uh, it's definitely on my radar because yeah, because um, they can't afford ZBrush, so they are allowed to use Blender at school. Oh, really? So yeah. Is it, is it free or something? It's free. It's oh, online. It's idea. a free software. That's yeah. I see people doing. like render and sculpt and do stuff with Blender. I hear it's yeah. an amazing software. Yeah, so it's cool. Oh, so definitely go look into. It. Oh, that's fantastic! I'm gonna check that out too. Yeah, I'm learning stuff too. I mean, I'm figuring out green screens and everything else. I, I, <laughs> my, <laughs> I'll be a full-time editor after this. <laughs> um, I'm Tommy Brunswick. Welcome to Horror Vision 2020. I'd like to welcome Steve Wang and, of course, my co-host, James Lewis. Uh-oh, oh. something's happening. Hold on a sec. <laughs> what happened now? And it's everything, everything's crazy. Because, you know, when you're at home, you got your animals running around. <laughs> so, all right. So, let's get started. Um, I guess... Okay, I'm a huge fan of yours. This is probably my most nervous interview. <laughs> I interview so many people. <laughs> but when I was young, of course, I was one of the strange girls that used to get Fangoria magazine from like the 12th issue on or something. And I used to have the sheet of all the masks that were in there. Um, and it had your, that's the was my first introduction to you were those masks that were on sale in the Fangoria magazine. I don't know who was selling them. But I remember, I think it was like your Guyver one. There's a couple of your masks in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. My Bible. And after that, I was like following you and all the different things. And when I um, started doing uh, sculpting and stuff, I reached out to you on Facebook and you communicated back with me about painting and stuff. And it was amazing. <laughs> so I want to thank you now for that because it pushed me along a lot, you know, I, doing yeah, that. I get, I get contacted a lot by a lot of people. I try my best to return, you know, and people mess uh, ones are really hard as ones like how do you make a monster yeah. you know, like how do you build a car you know, <laughs> like, you, know. Yeah. Yeah. you just hooked me yeah. up with some paint people in ohio or something yeah um, well now now it's a little bit easier because i can just point them to stan winston school you know? right that's what, and that's <laughs> where i i just i 
took some of your classes on there. So. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great resource for seeing what, how professionals work. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, you are definitely incredibly talented, and you've worked on some iconic, you know, creature designs and everything else, too. So one of them that I'm excited about, I don't know how much you had to part through it, was Bill and Ted's, the most recent Bill and Ted's uh, face the music. Oh, yeah. I hope that movie holds up to what their other I hope so, two too. I hope so, too. I had, a, I had a lot of fun working. Some great people I work with, uh, Bill Corso and Kevin Baker. What uh, the, movie was it? I'm sorry, uh, I totally, it kicked uh, the out. The new Bill um, and Ted movie coming out. Yeah, face, Bill and Ted face the music. Oh, yeah. Well, Bill and Ted, so William Sadler canceled my show because he was shooting that. So, oh, okay. you gotta get makes me feel it's okay. Yeah, no, was, I love him. It, yeah, I, I really have high, have high hopes for it because it was such a great crew. The director was awesome. But Dean Paris, though, he directed Galaxy. And uh, he was great to work with. And yeah, it was a fun bunch. So, you know, get to do something. You know, very short schedule, super fast, but for what we did. I'm excited. Cool. It keeps yeah. kicking out. Your audio keeps kicking out. Is it kicking out for you, James? Uh, Maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure I hear everything. So, oh, okay. Yes. I'll, maybe I'll get a little. Is that better? Yeah, it's sporadic. It was just sporadic. So, how did you get started in the business? Um, well, I've always loved making masks as a kid. You know, I collect masks since I was 10 years old. And by the time that I was 14, I, I collected about 30 masks. And at that point, I was like, you know, I really need to make, learn how to make it. I was always artistic, you know, in drawing and stuff, but I've never sculpted before. I didn't know. So I went to the library, found a bunch of books on theatrical makeup and, you know, plaster molding. And then Cinemagic came along with uh, Kirk Brady and how to make masks. And I thought, you know what, I need to do this. So I went and bought some cheap clay and my forks and spoons, started sculpting, and just kind of taught myself. And then about uh, five years in, I moved to L.A. with my good friend, Matt Rose. And uh, we started knocking on doors and we did it at Sam Winston's and... Rick Baker's, and was very lucky to get up. Wow, you just, just went to the five top. years. <laughs> yeah, just in the five years of doing it in my garage, just be able to come in. Just so. Yeah, actually, it is kind of cutting out a little bit. Yeah, I it's a bummer. Um, I have a microphone. Can you go get uh, it, maybe see if it works, because I'm cutting out and I'm only getting parts of what you're saying. And you can edit this, right? Jim? Well, I mean, I got most of that, but then now that you said it, I was thinking, like, yeah, it is kind of choppy. <laughs> But, but uh, that's, like well, we, that's how we just got to deal with it. In the yeah, technology. if we have to deal with it, we can deal with it. Either way. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, much better. Okay, yeah, I, I bought this thing just for this, but last time I used Zoom with the Stan Winston School, they they didn't need it for some reason. And then, oh. you know, so. Oh, this good. is perfect. Wow, that, yeah, that actually makes a huge difference. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> you want me to repeat what I said before? Yes, could you? Okay. How you got started? Oh, oh, gee, okay, cool. I'm cool. sorry. So, so the way that I, I got into the film industry, it started out when I was about 10. I started collecting uh, latex masks. And I did that for about four years. I collected about 30 masks. And, um, and then at that point, I went to the library and I, I got some theatrical makeup books. Uh, and how to how to do makeup and make masks and then Cinemagic had an issue with Kirk Brady and how to do a full latex mask and from there I decided you know I really need to do this so I went and bought some clay and, and I got some forks and spoons and just started teaching myself how to sculpt and then uh, made a bunch of masks and whatnot and then within about five years of that uh, I moved down to LA with my good friend Matt Rose and started knocking on doors and uh, we got into Stan Winston's and then Rick Baker's and and the rest, as they say, is history, you know? Yeah. So I heard, I don't know if it was an interview I saw with you or something, but it was about how airbrushes were introduced into special effects in, in the whole industry. It kind of started with Predator, am I right? Um, yeah, it's, it's well, I don't, I can't speak for the whole industry per se. Um, I'll tell you kind of my experience. Okay. Uh, when I first got into the, the business back in 85, Everybody was painting with Pax Paint, like Dick Smith invented Pax Paint. It's basically acrylic mixed with prosthetic adhesive B, uh, or Prozade. And, and um, so you mix that, you, you apply it just like with a brush and whatnot. And so airbrushes were not used as much back then. 
And so when I got into business, uh, I had came up with a new way of painting, like a new perspective on creatures, which is using like a nat nature's camouflage, like singing frogs and fish and all that kind of stuff. And I introduced that whole look uh, through Monster Squad, Gilman and through the Predator. And I remember when I went to meet Stan Winston right before Monster Squad, I had uh, painted a bunch of aliens at Boss Films called The Collector. And that was for Steve Johnson. He was the head of that show. And then I worked with Screaming Mad George on that. So George came up with the paint job and he did it with a brush. So I'd mimic that design and I did it all with the airbrush. And I, and I did it with the layers and make it look all translucent and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then when Stan Winston saw it in my interview, he asked me, how is this painted? He was kind of blown away by it. And I said, oh, it was all done with an airbrush. So that day, so after the interview, I left. Matt Rose was already working there on a show called uh, Amazing Stories. Um, and so Matt came back, to, came back home and he says, I don't know what you show Stan, but Stan came in after you left and says, all right, from now on, everything's going to be painted with an airbrush. <laughs> <laughs> So, That's awesome. Yeah, and so that that was kind of crazy, you know. And, and the funny thing was the way that I kind of got fell into that whole style because that they call that style of paint job the Steve Wang style, uh, you know, officially, I guess. It was kind of it was, it was, it's nice to have something, you know. Named, like if you told somebody, you know, I want to paint the Steve Wang style, they would know what you're talking about. Usually, yeah. it's like camouflage and dots and all this crazy stuff you see everywhere now. That's it's kind of awesome. like standard now. Um, and so the way that happened was uh, back in 86, I was making a costume for the Scream at George Halloween contest, the first one. And I had designed this hermit crab character with like uh, a crab armor and then like a samurai kind of a sword and, and, and outfit. And, um, and the, way, the reason I did that was I was looking at this old this, this seashell and it had all this depth and layers and it just looks, looked amazing. And I looked at it and, and just instantly I just said, I know how to paint that. I don't know why, but I know how to paint it, you know? And that's, and then I painted it and I won first prize for that contest. Uh, with the, you know, it was judged by Rick Baker, Stan Winston, oh Tom Berman, awesome. and, and Dick Smith. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was 19, no, I was 20 at the time. Wow. And so, so that really opened, you know, opened their eyes to what I was able to do. And, um, and somehow that just became my style. So after that, I did Monster Squad for Stan Winston. Stan just wanted to, be, he just said, paint however you want. Same thing as Predator. He's like, paint it however you want. You know, anything you do is going to be exceed my expectations. So he was very happy that, you know, to give me so much freedom. And, and I'm glad I didn't disappoint him. Yeah, because that yeah. Predator is amazing. It's so iconic. I, you know, I don't even know how you would come up with it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's nature. You know, you, you get inspired by na nature. is such a wonderful re reference. And I, I, I advise people whenever they're trying to learn to do art, yeah. follow nature follow human anatomy, animal anatomy, follow the way things look in, you know, in, in nature, in life, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's what we identify with. So we're going to instantly understand it when we see it. Um, and so that's, that's the best thing to do. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, well put. Yeah. So you also are a director. Um, what movies have you directed? I know a couple, I, I know a couple of them. Like Guyver. Yeah. Uh, I... yeah. Uh, this guy back here. Yeah, I love that character. It reminds me of Ultraman too. That's why I love it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I directed Guyver, I co-directed Guyver one with Scream at George, and that kind of came out uh, kind of a mess. Um, <laughs> but then I, I was able to do Guyver two on my own, which was this guy back here. Uh, it was a much darker, closer to the original comic. Uh, the comic was created by uh, a creator named Yoshi Kitakaya. That's his creation. So I was able to adapt that into a movie. And the second one that I did was closer to his the, the tone. Because I could never do his comic. His comic is like a $100 million movie, you know. And I had, like a, million, I had a million dollars to make this movie, a little bit less than that. <laughs> um, so I did those two. Uh, the first film that got me the first job doing Guyver was a film called Kung Fu Rascals. And it's a film that my dad and I financed ourselves. It was like a $40,000 movie shot on Super 8. And starring myself, which I'm not even an actor, and it's you know I'm terrible. <laughs> but, but a bunch of my friends were in it, um, and then um, it was kind of a kung fu fantasy movie. So it 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 was a, it, you know it was like a period piece. So we all wore costumes, and there's like a, a pig uh, character in it who's like a, the, one of the bad guys, and there's this bamboo man who is like this creation I made for the jitters that I ended up reusing. Um, and then we had these, these two giant 35 foot tall stone gods called the Neo Titan and made of Spartan. 
and they fought the beat. And forty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's all forced perspective. First there's perspective. some signatures, and we, we you know, there's lots of us running around them, and they're fighting each other, and it's crazy. Um, yeah, so we did that for forty thousand dollars, and that's what got me my first professional job as a director. Can film. we see that movie somewhere? Is it on YouTube? Uh, yeah, if you look up on on YouTube, just uh, Kung Fu Rascals, you'll see it's it's. <laughs> It's my first film. It's like, it's literally my film school. Like when I first made that film, <laughs> I knew nothing about filmmaking other than I shot a couple of Super 8 shorts and I did some editing on it, you know, at home. So this was my first like full feature and originally it was written to be a short film, like a 30 page script. And somehow that thing evolved into a full 90 minute feature. Uh, so it was a lot of ad-libbing, a lot of making stuff up as we went. So, <laughs> so don't expect like a masterpiece, but it is pretty, audacious in that it's very very ambitious yeah. and we did pull off a lot of crazy stuff in a little left with no money right did you uh did you like shoot it over a long period of time was it like hey guys let's shoot this we've got a schedule 30 days get it out or was no it, like, it was it? um I, ha I had i was planning it when i was doing uh, gremlins too mm -hmm. and so i spent a year on gremlins too and then and then the near the end of it when i was done building the character that, that i was doing for rick mohawk uh, oh, the spider. I that one more. Okay. Yeah, I did that for Rick, and then once I was done with it, I, I asked Rick if I could leave the show, and I'll come back on the days that Mohawk or Mohawk Spider worked on set. Um, so I did that. I would come back and work on set when they when he worked, but other than that, I, I left the show, and then I took a whole year off, uh, and was just planning my film and building sets and costumes, and basically shot on the weekends over a period of ten months. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and then oh, I edited God. the film in my bedroom, and then <laughs> and then I took it to a professional online place, and then <clears throat> the online got on the, the the master tapes, and then we did all the sound effects. Me and my, myself and my one of my best friends uh, in his garage. Um, we did all the sound there on a little, on an eight track recorder. <laughs> I fully I fully the entire film myself. <laughs> every footstep, every cloth rattle. Right, but every, that's that's before computer. So, yeah, so yeah. that's real Foley stuff. Yeah, like like record on tape, sync to time code, and perform it live kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's like so complicated now. You're like, oh, it's so easy. Click. <laughs> well, you know, it's very educational because the one thing I I realized early on that I didn't want to be a director. I wanted to be a filmmaker. You know, and there was a big difference. And you know, because in all my films, you know, not only do I like write, you know, and direct, but I also design. You know, and then uh, I schedule, you know, like, in fact, Guyver 2, I was the first AD as well. So I didn't have a first AD, which is kind of insane, you know. It is insane. You need production. that production sometimes. You know? Yeah. And then so, and then, uh, and then I'm also an editor. I edit it. Uh, I edit on all my films. I've written whole features myself. I've edited, you know, on my professional bigger films. I do half the editing myself. I'm a camera operator. You know, I, I shoot, I camera operate all the action stuff in my film, but I can also operate the drama stuff if I want to, you know, but usually I leave that to my DP so I can watch. Um, and then I even work as a camera operator for other films too, so. That's cool, so kind of like Robert Rodriguez does similar. Yeah, yeah, just a film, like it's like the more you understand, you know, even like sound mixing, you know, I'm in all the sound mixing, like when I was doing my TV series, Common Writer, um, I, had a, I had a sound mixer uh, working on the show who had done mostly TV, so, uh, he was a great guy to work with, uh, a guy named Nathan Smith. And so when I went to his studio, he had done a first pass on my first episode. And he says, I think this is pretty close. So I listened to it. I was like, nope, that's not what we're doing. And I kind of like worked with him and we remixed the entire show. And I kind of like injected a new style into how I like the, the show mixed, you know. And so so he learned a lot from it. I learned a lot from it. And then it was just a nice collaboration. And we had a lot of fun on that. Um, I also art direct the visual effects, you know, I have on my TV show, we did over 2000 shots um, on my show. And so my um, visual effects supervisor, Mark Allen, sup like supremely talented guy, he assembled a team from around the world. And we had this online server that all our footage was uploaded. And, and then I can, I, can, I can download stuff, draw stuff in, in Photoshop, put notes, you know, throw it back footage, whatever. So, so I was able to art direct uh, visual effects on my show a lot as well, you know, just doing it. I never met any of the guys on my team because they were literally spread out across the world. Wow. But it was such an effective, uh, a productive system to work with, you know, to get things done. Yeah.
that's because I uh, the only time I heard that the first time I heard that was Peter Jackson doing it with Lord of the Rings. I didn't yeah. know people could do that before that. It was like amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty standard. Now. Like if you work on any kind of production that is has visual effects, usually there's some kind of a, a server, a website you go to that's encrypted, yeah. and it has you know. Uh, just everything in there. So you can go in there, you can find the episode, the shots, the notes, everybody chimes in. I mean, it's, it's really, it's an amazing system that was set up. That's, my son works at Light Iron and they mm -hmm. just, cause he just got a job there and it's Panavision owned and they do that. That's what he yeah. does, the, the post stuff like that and they put it, he puts it all together. Yeah, it, it basically turns, it turns the, the community, it opens up quite a huge community now because now you can be anywhere around the world and you can yeah. work in real time, yeah. you know, with everyone. And you can stay safe at home. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. all of us, I said I loved it at the beginning. I don't know about now, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I do kind of miss people. <laughs> Me? Not so much. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a hermit by nature. <laughs> and my you know, brother says the same. Yeah, I just, I, I remember this, 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 I mean, you know, I'm married and, and my kids are at home right now too. So I got a full household and I have five animals in the house. So. <laughs> It's pretty crazy busy if I'm around the house, but I remember a time when, when I was just living by myself in my house and I was working out of my house as well. So for six months, I hardly saw anybody. And, and one time I remember literally stopping and, and, and thinking to myself, my God, I had not actually physically spoke in two weeks. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, and I didn't even realize it. Like I literally did not speak for two weeks because I was at my house by myself the whole time, just working and doing whatever, wow. you know. And and I didn't. I, I loved it. I really loved it. So awesome, though. <laughs> but I'm very social too. I can be. You know, it's like I'm not like a. I'm not a recluse, yeah. but I think I'm naturally inclined. Like if if I had to hunker down, I I, I would just. <clears throat> No problem, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of good. It's good for the soul anyway. Like I go through spurts where it's like I need this and then I go through spurts. Speaking currently, I go through spurts where I'm like, oh, it feels so good. And then I have days where I'm just going, I'm going crazy. I need to do something. Why can't I go meet anybody? Yeah. And then thank God we have, you know, this platform right now so we can do things like this. And, and yeah, I, I did my first Zoom wedding uh, a few weeks ago. No way. Yeah. Did, like, were you just attending? Yeah, I was attending. Oh, yeah, a friend of mine, wow. a friend of mine was getting married, and she didn't want to change her wedding date. And so instead of you know going there, we were actually looking forward to going to attending the wedding uh, in Ohio because we wanted a little break. But since we couldn't go, everybody was just on Zoom, and we just watched it live, and we was like able to interact, and it was pretty. That's it was amazing. Cool. That's amazing. Yeah, that that's, we can do that. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I I mean, I hope we don't you know set back and start doing things like that all the time but that's incredible that you can actually you know yeah. be a part of something yeah, yeah. I, I have some other social meeting things and people from all over the world started coming in on it and it was amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. cool so technology definitely it does work for a lot of yeah we had a I, I have a little group uh called the ufo bros and we just it's just a bunch of friends we talk about ufos and paranormal stuff you know Normally we have a meeting like once every few months. We go out to have dinner and then we hang out at, at one one of the members' house and we just talk UFO and paranormal. And then so this is the first time we actually did it on Facebook. We just had the lights like Zoom. We had like seven of us on there and just for like a few hours. Was talking. it just as good? Was it the same kind of dynamic? Um, I think it's pretty close. Yeah, I mean it was you know it was just you just it's just a bunch of friends. So, so yeah, yeah. And, and there was a lot of a lot of ground to cover. So you know. We had to get in on the latest UFO news. Like how crazy is it? How crazy is it a couple of days ago, the Pentagon finally confirmed that that video that was released was real and that, that was, those are real UFOs and nobody cared. No, dude, I swear to God, like two weeks ago, I had a UFO over, oh, in, I'm in Van Nuys and I'm like, that sounds ridiculous. But I was talking to my buddy on the phone and I look up and at first I thought it was like a kid released like one of those balloons, mm -hmm. but it wasn't moving. It was just hovering like up in the clouds, high enough for the low, uh, with the low clouds to kind of pass through it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, Travis, that thing isn't going. And I like took a quick picture of it and zoomed in. He's like, that's insane. And it, and I, I can't explain it, but I just yeah. thought I'd throw that in there. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of UFOs. Uh, I've seen quite a few in, in, in front of my house and you know, and it, you see a lot where it's, could be explained you know like it could be satellites it could be whatever like the other night i looked up in the sky and there was like dozens of lights moving in one direction 
but that weren't that weren't they were like blinking every so often, like glowing and going down, whatever. But then we I took my my little satellite uh, app and looked up, and they were all satellites. Oh. So you know, there's some stuff that are definitely explainable, but there's stuff that was definitely not like Starlink. Like one time, I looked up in front of my house. Uh, I I I look. I'm, I'm I'm kind of a stargazer, you know. I look at stars all the time, and the Orion cluster, I, I look at all the time. I use that to sort of identify where we are, you know. Usually, it's like there's in the middle of it. There's like three dots, and then one dot in the bottom it's like a perfect triangle um and so once i looked up and the three dots had actually had four evenly spaced dots and i looked up and i thought well that's unusual and i before i pointed up to my wife to, to have her look at it that one dot was stationary it went literally sideways like this and go shoo, disappeared right that quickly oh, that's awesome now, that's, that, that is a ufo that's like something you look at it's like we don't have the technology to do that you know and if we do no. No one knows, right? I mean, they're not coming out to the public. So that's definitely something that's more, very unusual, that kind of stuff. Can I uh, say one more thing before we move on from UFOs? Yeah. Since I, I, I'm, I'm big into this as well. So like uh, around two years ago, I was working a silver mine while we were trying to start one in Idaho at like 9,000 feet. Um, the lady that owned the mountain next to us, you know, she had stories when we first met with her. She was like, yeah, when I, they lived up there for 20 years working in slate and silver. She's like, yeah, UFOs are, it's a big deal up here because of the minerals, because of all mm -hmm. this stuff. It's a big deal. Minerals. And like, we spent a, just the minerals, is that what that is? Minerals and the earth, because I don't think they're interested necessarily. I mean, they're, maybe in us, but like, there's more things. Yeah, they're not yeah, we're, 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 for us to kill we're, very minis, we're very minuscule. We're all yeah. we're all crazy. Right. Um but we is same experience. Like you would be we would be up there at nighttime um because we were trying to protect the lot because there's a lot of people that were trying, it's a long story, but either way you'd see cuz up there there's no there's no uh light pollution. It's all natural. There's no pollution. Period. And I mean, you look at the night sky for five hours, just staring, and it's and it's miraculous. But you see that nonstop. You see them come down to the mountains. You see them just, and it's like they'll be there, and then boo, and they're gone. And it's, it was yeah. such an incredible. Like I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about how when I was, like, and I'd experienced it in Michigan too. But like that, in that in 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 that environment, in that setting, I mean, me and my buddy that were there doing this. It was it was just an incredible experience. So yeah, they probably I'm on board probably, with you, buddy. Well, they probably have underground, um, you know, bases they go into as well because that happens a lot in Hawaii and in uh, also at uh, Mount Shasta. We I've seen UFOs in Shasta before a couple of times, you know, and they they usually go down into the mountains and stuff. So they're hiding down there somewhere as well. Yeah, they say the ocean too. I mean, that's why California, yeah, yeah. like Los Angeles, is a big mm -hmm. yeah USOs, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. cool. That's that's amazing to me. I get excited about. This. I watched Ancient Aliens because when I was um, out of high school, I read uh, Chariots of the Gods. Yeah. That was a huge. Eric Von yeah. 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 Yeah, and then of course I saw the, the documentary, and I was even more enthralled. And you know, now that the TV show came out, it was like you know. So yeah, I've yeah I finally saw I finally saw Eric Von Daniken in person last year. Who? Uh, yeah, Eric Von Daniken, the guy who wrote the. Oh, Eric. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. I love that. Uh, George, George the guy, yeah. yeah, the guy, yeah, the I main. Because yeah. no matter what, it's aliens. <laughs> yeah. No, Giorgio, Giorgio is a friend of mine. Yeah, he's awesome. That's awesome. He's, just, yeah. he's like, I, I know a ton of people that are just huge fans of his. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a good. It's guy. a great show, you know, because it, it asks a lot of hard questions, and yes, maybe they they push things, you know, quite a, towards in favor of, of using UFOs and aliens to explain things. But still, you know, it's just if you keep an open mind and make your own decisions. What's the harm in listening and, and hearing the possibilities? Because so many people are shut off from the idea that what if, you know, this could be real. Yeah, Sometimes it's stranger than fiction. More than just us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So enough about aliens. <laughs> yeah. I know. We could now, now I'm starting <laughs> to see like real yeah. big, it's like we could talk about this we're all We're gonna day cut now. this whole part out of the interview anyway. <laughs> no, no, we're gonna leave it. I love it. Because the whole idea of Horror Vision 2020 is to get to know people. You know, because we started, Jim and I started doing this before this coronavirus um, because I run Motor City Nightmares. And then when I had to cancel or postpone, let's say postpone, um, until J July, then we said, well, let's just 
let's just do this now and let's just mm -hmm. give it away for free and see what happens and yeah. amazing things have happened and people love watching it on because uh, i have a big audience on motor city nightmares that's great yeah oh so, yeah it's exciting and that's why we want to know about you so this is part of who you are <laughs> that's cool yeah <laughs> i mean you can say cut that out and i guess i'll do it but <laughs> oh no i don't care i don't care i mean you know I, I'm hoping that in my lifetime that we'll have disclosure on aliens. You know, I, I feel bad for all the people that UFOlogists, people that follow, have done so much tremendous work in the UFO community who have passed away, you know, from old age, who have never been able to hear the truth. Yeah. They know the truth, but they've just never been able to, like, get confirmation, you know. And I think, so I, I, I think hoping, we will in our lifetime. Yeah. I'm hoping to get that in our lifetime, in my lifetime. So yep. what is your favorite movie that you've worked on or that you've done? Um, or a few of them. You don't have to say it's just fifth one. <laughs> you have a lot. Uh, you mean the ones I directed or one that's, that I... Either or. Your oh. favorite projects that worked on. Well, I mean, there, there are projects that I've worked on that were a lot of fun, met some great people, and the movie is not so great. And then there are movies that are like, well, it was a nightmare to work on, but then the movie came out incredible. So I guess they're just varying various degrees on what, you know, what I guess we consider great. But um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, were, we were talking to another director, and I love this one movie he did called Grave Dancers. And it, he kept making this face every time I would say that. Oh, and, Mike Mendez. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know. You know <laughs> like, <laughs> and, he, and then he told me the whole story, and I was like, I'm sorry, I keep asking. <laughs> yeah. Did you, see yeah, his, you, did you see his little short he made on the, the puppet Guillermo? I love that. Wasn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I told everybody to go watch. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that movie Grave Dancers, but he didn't have a good experience. He, he was like, it was the worst experience of, his, of all his career. And it's like, well, Tommy loves it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, just speaking as a director, you, you directors get, we get our asses handed to us. I mean, it's horrible. It's, yeah. You want to meet some of the worst people on the planet, go work in, work in films and deal with, you know, producers and money people. You know, I'm not saying they're all bad. There are some amazing producers are very supportive of filmmakers and, and whatnot for sure you know i've worked with some but then when you when you end up working with the bad ones oh my god it's like they treat you like they treat you like you're an ant you know like I, and, and it's just it's the most horrible situation you just see bad people but um like i did a film called drive years ago with mark the um and that one that one got a lot of uh, attention you know i won i won a couple of film festivals um, like Fantasia 98, I won the, the best international film over there. Awesome. Um, voted by the audience, and that was really unexpected. That's actually. Yeah, that's yeah. big by the audience. And, um, and then, uh, you know, and that was, that was great. Like, the cast was awesome, you know, Mark DeCascos, Kadeem Hardison, uh, Brittany Murphy, you got to work with Brittany, and she's amazing. Uh, such, a, such a beautiful spirit, you know. Um, and, and then you get into the, 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 the other, the, the downside of it, it was, was you know, at one point we went over budget. I had no idea because I wasn't producing it. And my producer was, came up to me and told me that morning, like, hey, a uh, bond company is coming to talk to you because we were, we're like half million over budget. I'm like, half million? How the hell did we get a half million? <laughs> right, you know, and, and then so I was like, okay, I'll talk to them. And it was like kangaroo court, you know, you sit there and it's like, it's like there's these five old guys are sitting there like you know basically with a gavel like ready to declare you guilty and send you to the you know to the galleys you know and and so um ultimately it you know you you, you got to deal with that kind of stuff and you know and i walked out there thinking well you know they're gonna fire me today okay whatever you know i, I tried and they didn't fire me uh for reasons they told me later was that they couldn't replace me they couldn't find anyone to replace me because I was already working 22 hours a day and I, oh, yeah, they can. and I'm not kidding you. I was up 22 hours a day for 35 days straight working on my, wow. yeah, I directed two units simultaneously. And it was just like, wow. um, and so they, and, and they love what they were seeing. That's the other part that saved my ass was that they, it wasn't that they weren't happy with the film. They were very happy with it. It was just that money was a problem. So one of the investors stepped up and put up the rest of the money and, and, you know, was able to, you know, let us finish, but, so worth it, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then the fact that you didn't even know. And then post production, I wanted to kill myself because after, <laughs> after I delivered the film, you know, and and we had so many amazing screenings with the NRG test groups and 
and you know scored extremely high, always in the 90 percentile range. Um, the film was taken away from me and uh, recut and all these lies were told to me and you know and then they butched the shit out of the film and it came out two years later uh, and, you know and, and my cut of the film was never released in this country the country of origin uh, but now everywhere else it's done well but my cut was never released here still like 24 years later well so, people will find it my my kids they have a knack at finding like the original cuts of things they like mm -hmm. that is like their thing to go do so I yeah put them on that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean my my original cut went out in england um and they did an amazing job they did a behind the scene with it, commentary photo gallery i mean everything and when it came out it actually outsold the james bond uh box set awesome yeah i mean it was it, it was on they, he sent me the facts of of the the weekly things that it was up there in the top five it's amazing That's cool. so yeah but but you know it was bittersweet after that i was like i'm done making movies you know? <laughs> and i left i left for a while and i came back i think about i want to say quite a while later i came out like six six seven years later that's when i came back to do my tv series but it took a while for me to come back because i was so disenchanted by the whole franchise and the whole just how things worked you know did you work at the did you do the video game stuff in between there or was that after oh uh, that was after the, okay because that's the one thing is um my son because in the quarantine he uh, started having me play fallout 4. Yeah. <laughs> so i'm learning how to play it it's like amazing so like i'm in trouble now <laughs> Yeah, Fallout. Fallout's a great series. Yeah. yeah. So, did, have you ever done anything with Bethesda or just Blizzard? Um, mostly Blizzard. Um, I don't think I've done anything with Bethesda. No. Okay. But I, I play a lot of the games. I'm playing some of the games now. So. Oh, yeah. that's cool. What games? What's your favorite games? Um, <laughs> gosh, I, uh, I'm trying to think. Did they? No, who put out? Did they publish Doom? Is that Doom. No, no. Well, there's a there's a series that I that I've been playing over and over again i'm playing my fourth time now and all the expansion um it's uh oh god put me on the spot my brain, <laughs> my brain does not work well sorry um, um, um we can fill in the blank right dishonored there. dishonored oh yeah dishonored. dishonored yes is that just the, the most amazing series it's like every once in a while you come across a, ser a game series that's like like that where it's so immersive and so well designed like like triple a class you know, kind of game. So yeah, I've played, so I played Dishonored 1 and 2 and all the expansions. Uh, like, this is my fourth time. I just finished it again like, a few weeks ago. That's cool. My yeah. son's going through all the Silent Hills. Yeah. In fact, he found the, uh, an original cut of Silent Hill by the director or something. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was so excited about. He said it's so much better than the actual movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'd say. He goes and he finds that. So yeah. that, that's something that he crazy kids <laughs> and I'm, then I'm playing the new doom you know yeah it just funny. came out it just came yeah out yeah that just that's just a fun like shoot fest and well the yeah. creatures look so amazing too because yeah. like, that's one of the things about dishonored as well like dishonored is just so rich and beautiful looking it's so fun not just the story it's just yeah. the, the design of the game it's yeah really and the amazing. whole the whole stealthiness of it and and the challenge yeah. of trying to figure out how to get from one place to the next and you know, you, you can do it. You can play the whole game without killing one person or you can go in and annihilate everyone you want. Yeah. You know, it's up to you how you want to play and the outcome of the game comes out according to how you behave. Oh, so those cool. are really interesting. That's yeah. really cool. Almost like an AI. Yeah. That's gonna... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just played a, a game called Control as well, which is getting a lot of buzz, but I couldn't finish it because um, I hate this. I, you know, games that don't have a, 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 a manual save mode that makes you repeat the same things over and over again. Oh, yeah. Especially after you beat a hard boss, and then you have to like go at it again, or you're getting very close to beating it, and you can't save, and you have to do, oh man, it's like, I get so frustrated with that. It's enough for me to stop playing a game. <laughs> and I don't know why, I don't know why they do that. It's, it's simple to just write a little line of code that says manual save, you know? And it just like, like, people don't have that kind of patience, especially me, like I'm a professional, I work a lot. If yeah. I have 10 minutes to play for today, just to play i want that option i don't want to have to say well i gotta commit 15 20 minutes to beat this one you know save point and if i don't then i gotta keep coming back and playing over and over again it's like it's no fun for me i'm not a child and like, don't treat me like a child <laughs> <laughs> tomb raider was like i remember the original couple tomb raiders like you go so far and if you got killed you'd have to start like 
that whole thing yeah, over again. Yeah, it's frustrating, right? It's not fun. If it's not fun anymore, why does anybody want to play? Right. Exactly. Well, then I'm glad Fallout has that quick save because <laughs> it would be yeah. horrible. To Quick save is the it's the best invention ever for video games because you know <laughs> yeah. you can't it's like one size does not fit all and and game game uh, de developers that that don't understand that really just is doing gamers a big disservice. Yeah, and we're not, all, we're not all the same. Gamers talk and they know you know yeah. that's like a big yeah. thing for them. <laughs> yeah, if I find out a game had has automatic save, you know, or if it's something I know that it's going to be too difficult. I won't even bother because I want to have fun. I want to be able to play it on my own terms. Yeah. If I if I was a game developer, not only would I give you automatic save, I would also give you the cheat codes right off the front. Oh. Just here's the cheat code. <laughs> yeah, if it's not competitive a uh, game, right? If it's just a single person experience, yeah. here are all the cheat codes. Play this, it the way play, you want to play. I play game. If you get it stuck, <laughs> yeah. you get stuck, use the cheat codes, get out of it, and oh. then shut it off and keep going. Or yeah. play on cheat with cheat codes and just beat the whole game in ten minutes. However you want, you know, it's, it, sh it should be your experience. You have fun with it because ultimately if I, if you make a game that's too hard and people can't beat it and they give up on it, half your game is not played and no one will ever see the hard work that you actually put into it. If I was a game developer, I don't care how they play. I want them to experience the whole game and see all the work that we put into it. That's how I, that's how I think, you know, but they're not, a lot of games are not catering to people like, like myself. I mean, there are a lot of us out there. That's yep. It. Yep. So I was in your shop and I got to see all your, um, the different, uh, the room that you go in and you see all of the different statues and everything. Mm -hmm. Did, are those all yours? Did you create all of those? Everything that's in there? Well, yeah. they're, little, they're little toys and little things that are not. They're like stuff I bought from friends or whatever we put in there. But like for you the, have the a majority. Mini -wise and, you know, all the. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. That's all the stuff we do. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm gonna. We'll put that in the. I have some of the video, but we have to okay. put some of that in because it's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, just going there was awesome, and, and uh, I think it was your wife. She's like, you can take pictures of this, but not of this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some. Some of sometimes we're working on stuff that's still under NDA, so we have to be very selective. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But you, you since released it, it's that big alien, like the big woman uh, demon for Disney. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, I can say it because I... <laughs> yeah, no, she's already been out, yeah. Yeah, it was beautiful. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that work in the, the one girl, she kind of looks like Predator and she's from a video game or something. I just... Oh, yeah, Kerrigan. Oh, my Star gosh. I think that's like yeah. beautiful. Uh, <laughs> the work is uh, yeah. So, yes, I'm very excited. Uh, so, what do you have coming up? Like, after... Coming up? Well, um, I don't know. We were bidding on a lot of stuff and it was looking really good and then everything shut down. Um, I think we're supposed to do another Blizzard project, um, and uh, they literally, we literally got to the point where they're saying, okay, uh, when can you start? Because we want to get it by a certain time for BlizzCon. And then that's when everything shut down, because then we got the order to shut down. So I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing that, hopefully. I don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. Maybe it's not going to happen this year now because of it. So we're like this close to, you know, getting a lot of things going, and then nothing yeah well everything is going to hit at the same time it's going to be crazy because i know um one of my friends uh tiffany chef is her husband is a writer he writes for the mayans but he also writes a bunch of features um he is non-stop writing non-stop working they have him working like crazy so there is going to be so much work coming to everyone so i'm excited so the yeah. writers are still working like crazy. Yeah, I met Tiffany Shippers years ago. I love her. She's yeah, there was a film. There was a film that a friend of mine was in. Um, oh God, I forgot what the movie was now. It's, it was quite a while ago, uh, and so she asked me to go to watch the movie. So I watched the movie, and then I, that's when I first was aware of T Tiffany. And just randomly, a month later or something, I went to a Halloween party up in the Hollywood Hills, and there she was. So I went up to her and said, hey, you know, I, I saw you in this movie, whatever, whatever, you know, completely not realizing that a girl like her probably gets hit on by a lot of creeps, you know? <laughs> and so I said that thinking I was, you know, I, I, I'm just a, a one professional to another or whatever. I'm all my friends in this movie, whatever, I just whatever. And then she looked at me all weird. I was like, okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to see this and she's going to go, oh. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, well, it's no, no big deal. It's just, oh, no, she's so cool. You, you get to know her. It's, so it's, cool. Yeah, I, I was just, you know, I was excited. Like, oh, I, I saw her, just saw her in this movie that my friend was in, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, she's cool. It's a good thing. Yeah, she, was, she was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, is that the project that was with things shut down, actually? Are there things that are just totally gone now because of this? I have no idea. Oh, because okay. it really depends on when when everything happens because some of these some of these things are contingent on conventions too like they're they're unveiling it at conventions like blizz cons and yeah. comic cons you know like all these things that because they're canceled we, there's no rush to do them and yeah. so and i'm not even sure how if the economy is going to bounce back because BlizzCon is heavily contingent on people coming right Normally they sell out really fast so it's like my it's, show too but the hardest thing is how are you going to keep people apart you know, because well, you can't. That's the whole thing. The pandemic right. has to be over, or else it right. isn't going to happen. Be over because I know right. that I'm going to create some masks for everybody and things like that. But still, physically, they're all too close. Yeah. So yes, that's, I'm not. I'm not hopeful. That, so right. hopefully, the uh, pandemic, the uh, vaccines, they are hopeful. Yeah. At the end of the year. Once that once that come out, I think that that's when the things are going to be different. Yeah. Thank because you. right now, yeah, it's you know, I have, I was, I was just got, I just got contacted by a producer. Um, that I've been working with about a feature film that we're designing and building some stuff for. And he contacted me saying, hey, you know, we're still going. We just, we just got to keep pushing until we get the okay. Yeah. But he's still, just let me know we're, we're still on. But now we, you know, it's yeah. a matter of waiting. Yeah. yeah. It's a, that's the painful part about what we're going through is like, it's just like the anticipation. anticipation. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I'm on board. Like, this is great. I love it. At the same time, it's like, Ah, when is it going to kind of get back to normal? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and me just moving out here, it's like I was ready to start, and then I, and then I restart. <laughs> but all is yeah. good, you know. Yeah, feast or famine in this town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's okay. I was feast or famine at home too. So yeah. it I, think I, I think I've been through like two writer strikes already. Oh, yeah. One, <laughs> yeah. one in the late '80s was a big one. Man, that that one was a huge purge. Uh, people leaving the industry, and then the, the second one was another purge. Well, the second one leaving. was when all of the reality shows came out of, right? Mm -hmm. That's when that exploded, and then it, yeah, like, and a lot of people left the industry. And then when CG came in, yeah. that was the last nail in the coffin. Yeah. And then somehow, <laughs> makeup effects became a, the zombie that was resurrecting, clawed his way out of the coffin. And now it's like you know, it's it's thriving. Like half the world now is like turning to zombies. <laughs> and, makeup, and makeup and makeup lives again you know it lives again <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep. but the, but marrying both of them is what's amazing those are the things that are amazing is marrying both of those the visual the digital effects with the practical yeah yeah, yep. that, yeah. yeah. It, do you do a lot of that because you're you said you're you're working uh did you do digital stuff too um yeah but i mean i don't do digital effects or anything i i, I design in digital I mean, um, you know, I do ZBrush and whatnot, and then um, my studio, we do a lot of digital work in my oh. studio. Okay, that's cool. cool so cool. I work with a lot of digital artists. Right. So what was Stan Winston like? Is he in Stan? Um, Stan's the kind of guy you want on your side. Yeah. Yeah. He, <laughs> he is, uh, people like that, yeah. Yeah, he's a great businessman. He's very smart, yeah. you know, um, very passionate. And, uh, and if he sees that you can do something well, great for his company, he'll give you the opportunity. Yeah. You know, he's, he's the kind of boss that you, that you want. He's yeah. hard on you, too. If, you know, if you're fucking up, he'll, he'll let you know. <laughs> okay. and, uh, what about uh, Rick Baker? How is he to work for? Rick, Rick is a little bit more hands-off. Like, you know, like, uh, Rick is like my hero as a kid growing up. And he still is. You know, he's, yeah. he's definitely had, the, I think, the biggest impact in my, in my life as an artist. Um, and so... Uh, working with Rick was was different because Rick had a very hands-off approach. He tends to just let you do what you do, you know, let you bring something to the table. And uh, and so he would not give you any art direction. He would not tell you how to do anything, really. He just like, you just he hires you based on the merit of why he hired you and he lets you do the work. That's, that's so awesome. yeah, it's interesting because of all the different people that I've worked with, like every boss has their own thing you know some studios they art direct you to death yeah. you know and some studio just like you just do what you do it just depends you know um so i'm kind of i'm kind of in the middle i think 
primarily, I think when it comes to working on original stuff, I'm a little freer. You know, I let my artists do do things and bring something to the table. I'm I'm a little bit more Rick Baker style, but when it comes to to uh, the video game stuff, I'm much much harder on that because you have to service the client. You know, you have to you have to create and represent their their uh, characters and their their IP. So like you know, like for instance, if you work for uh, Disney and you make a replica of Mickey Mouse, it better look like Mickey Mouse. Mickey right? Mouse yeah. So it's like that kind of stuff. So it's just depending on, on the project, you know. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'm always a huge fan. But Rick Baker and you were some of my favorite all time favorites. <laughs> so it's amazing. Yeah, if you see all the stuff on Instagram Rick's been posting. Yeah. He's scanning he's scanning all his old sculptures and printing these little things. And he's painting he, he, them. and he himself is a white walker just in paint. Yeah, that was incredible. Oh, my yeah. God. That was, <laughs> it was like, oh, my God. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at, he's shot a video of all the sculptures he has. I'm like, I got to have it. <laughs> Everybody wants it. He can make a killing if he sells copies. I know, but he doesn't even care. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So um, in your company now that is Onyx Forge, correct? Yeah. And do pe can people go to your website and look at stuff? Yeah, just go to the theonyxforge.com. Yeah. All right, we'll put it up underneath here. Right, Jim? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Do you have any other questions, Jim? No, but I, I want to say, and I haven't said this to any, and we've done a lot of interviews, but Steve, you rock, man. You're my favorite interview. This is, yeah, like... Yeah, I mean, you inspired me before this and like all this stuff, but just your personality, your character, yeah. incredible interview. And I thank you so much for uh, doing it with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you that. so much for everything. And I will be in touch with you. We'll let you know when this gets edited. Okay, and put up. okay great. I'm, I'm going to bomb your UFO uh, bros when, when we're back in the thing. <laughs> I, also, one day you're going to be like, how did you find me? And I'm like, <laughs> Well, send me a send me a message on Facebook, and I'll 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 bring you into the group. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we we do it once every few months, just kind of a you know a casual thing. So. Cool. Awesome, dude. Yeah. Awesome. Will do. Okay. All right, man. All right, you guys. Take Thanks. care. Talk to you soon. Yeah, you take Bye. care. Yep. Bye.